Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My apologies for the delay in starting. I have the honor and privilege of moderating session two, Canada and the Black Atlantic World. My name is Claudine Bonner, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to quickly introduce our panelists, and uh, we'll jump right in. And since we have a break immediately after the presentations, I will ask you to save your questions for the mingling after. So our first presenter today is Dr. Harvey Amani Whitfield. Dr. Whitfield is a professor of North American history. He attended Dalhousie University for his MA and PhD. He's the author of several books, including Blacks on the Border, The Black Refugees in British North, North America, 1815 to 1865. North to Bondage, Loyalist Slavery in the Maritimes and Black Slavery in the Maritimes, A History and Documents. His book, Biographical Dictionary of Enslaved Black People in, Mar in the Maritimes, was published in late March of this year. His future research projects will illuminate how enslaved black women and their experiences tell historians a great deal about slavery in Canada. He's an active member of the Canadian historical profession and serves on various editorial advisory boards, including Acadiensis, Labor, and the Canadian Historical Review. His presentation today is titled, An Enslaved Black Family at the Crossroads of Slavery and Freedom in Colonial Canada. Of course, I don't think I even needed to introduce him. Our second presenter today is Adrian Shad. Adrian Shad is a consultant, a curator and author who has conducted research for plaques, films, and exhibits, including, quote, I'll use my freedom well, end quote, the exhibit at Uncle Tom's Cabin in Black Mecca, the story of Chatham's black community. Most recently, she has collaborated on the black heritage of the ward, the neighborhood for installation at the new courthouse just north of Osgoode Hall in Toronto. Much of Adrian's work has looked at history over a large span of time and has dealt with changes in black communities from pre-industrial times through the Industrial Revolution and its impact on the 20th century. This is evident in her book, The Journey from Tollgate to Parkway, African Canadians in Hamilton, which, as the title indicates, traces the black community of Hamilton and Wentworth County from the late 18th century through the early 21st century. Whether she's researching the Colored Corps during the War of 1812 uh, for the Tubman Institute's online project, We Stand on Guard for Thee, or she's focusing on black workers and communities from 1900 to World War II and beyond in uh, her traveling exhibit, And Still I Rise, A History of African Canadian Workers in eight, Ontario, 1900 to, to present. The theme of advancing technology and its impact on black history is always present in her work. Her foray into children's literature in early civilizations of Africa in the Sankofa Black Heritage Collection, for example, includes such topics as the ancient city of Timbuktu and math and writing in early Africa. Her presentation today is titled, The Heyday, Black Business in the 19th Century. Our final presenter today is Candina Doucette. Candina is a high school teacher currently working in Weymouth, Nova Scotia. She's passionate about teaching students, but especially about African Canadian history. History is alive and affecting our daily lives today in one way or another. After graduating from Acadia University with a major in history, Candina continued her research on African Nova Scotian history with a focus on Digby and Annapolis counties. Under the mentorship of Claudine Bonner, and Carolyn Smarts Frost, she de de uh, delivered presentations on slavery in Digby and Annapolis counties, the number two construction battalion, systemic racism today, and the Underground Railroad. Outside of teaching and researching, Candina is a mom of three children between the age, ages of two and 13, living in Bear River, Nor uh, Nova Scotia. Candina's presentation today is titled Slavery in Digby and Annapolis counties. So I will cede the floor to Dr. Whitfield. I wish you could see me, but my camera doesn't seem to be working. And so we tried to do it through my phone, but that didn't seem to quite work either. But nevertheless, I'm still so happy to be here today to speak to all of you. And it's a great honor, you know, to have been invited by um, Afua and Carolyn and also 
um, to be introduced by a dear friend of mine, Dr. Bonner. So that's all wonderful. Um, today, I'm just going to briefly uh, discuss this sort of black family at the crossroads of uh, slavery and freedom um, by focusing on an enslaved women, uh, woman uh, named Stacia. Um, and right now, my graduate student, Jesse Eaton, and I um, uh, are sort of, we're working on a short grant proposal, just trying to get things together and, and try to, you know, understand the lives of, uh, you know, mostly individual enslaved women, but also of enslaved men. Okay, so in 1805, an enslaved black woman named Stacia gave a deposition to secure the freedom of her enslaved son, Richard Hopefield Jr. As scholars like Marissa Fuentes and Stephanie Hunt Kennedy argue, enslaved black women are, regu are regularly silenced by the archive. Um, that's just like a fancy pants way of saying that when we look for evidence about enslaved black women uh, and enslaved people, and you could even go as far to say poor white people, um, there's usually not a lot of documentation. Um, if historians are fortunate enough to have multiple documents about an enslaved woman, which is extremely rare, we must always remember that white slaveholders generated the majority of source material about enslaved people. These owners who employed violence or the threat of violence to extract labor from their slaves, right? So indeed, some of the best documents about enslaved black people or enslaved indigenous people in colonial Canada are actually runaway slave advertisements, whereby owners clearly wanted to return their runaways to endless bondage. I think what's fascinating is that despite these admitted archival silences, some of the most illuminating stories or biographical fragments of enslaved people actually come from the experiences of black women. Mary Postal, Lydia Jackson, Elizabeth Watson. Stacia is another one of these people. And she's an excellent example of how black women actively fought the erasure of their lives by imprinting their experiences on the historical record. This brief, the, this brief talk that I'm giving today, I'll just sort of sketch out some of the methodological challenges of writing about enslaved black people in this story of, of Stacia, because it's a really incredible story. Um, so scholars have multiple sources on Stacia's life, amazingly including a short entry from the Book of the Negroes, an incredibly descriptive runaway slave advertisement, the deposition of her husband, and other court documents. While these documents only say so much about her life, they do allow historians to partially trace and understand the contours of her life. Um, in her deposition, and this is important, Stacia gave a deposition, but unfortunately it was lost or misplaced or stolen, I'm not sure, um, uh, from the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick sometime in the early 1980s. I'm very thankful that retired University of New Brunswick law professor David Bell kindly sent me a copy of his transcribed version and a picture of the document earlier this year, which I had not seen before he sent it to me. I had never seen it, and then he sent it to me, which was really helpful. And in this deposition, Stacia talks briefly about her life. She started off by saying, it's in the third person, of course, uh, that she was born within his majesty's late province of New York, about 11 years prior to the American War that she was claimed as a slave by one Louis Guyon of East Chester, New York. Um, it's not that difficult for us as historians to reconstruct the first years of, of, of her life as she probably worked on a New York farm and also performed household duties. That would have been very normal stuff to do for a child under 15 that was enslaved in New York. Now, what Stacia did not mention, sadly enough, are actually some of the most important details. For example, 
Where was her mother? Who was her father? Did she have any siblings? Was her owner her father? Indeed, the runaway advertisement from uh, New Brunswick described her as being, and I'm quoting now, mulatto. Um, before the war, one Gabriel Fowler purchased a young Stacia and bought her to the Maritimes. Now, I have to say that, you know, it, historical documentation can be very, very difficult, and we don't always have all the answers. And I know for myself that in my biographical dictionary of enslaved black people, um, UMB Special Collections expert uh, Leah Grandy helped me discern that an enslaved 17-year-old mother named Statch, S-T-A-C-H, with an infant son, Joe, listed in the Book of Negroes, was very likely the same person as Stacia, because Statch was, uh, according to the Book of Negroes, uh, owned by Gabriel Fowler. Um, this similarity escaped my attention because Stacia is listed uh, in a runaway advertisement only eight or nine years later as being almost 30 with multiple children, but without a 10-year-old son. This possibility provides another piece of Stacia's journey. The insights of David Bell and Leah Grandy clarified and untangled, and untangled some of these difficult archival threads that I did not understand, nor at this point in my career am I afraid to, to admit. I mean, I think as historians, we all build on the work of each other. I know, for example, I built on the work so much of Carolyn, of David States, of Afua Cooper, right? So I think that that's important to, to, to keep in mind. And, you know, a hallmark of Stacia's life, and I have to say, I, I, this, this is something I've noticed. I, I, I do think it, it happens quite often in the Maritimes. I don't know if that makes us unique, but basically is that her owner sold her repeatedly. But in her incredible deposition, and I hope everybody can hear this, um, Stacia goes into really important detail. And she says... Gabriel Fowler sold her to Dr. Joseph Clark, who, as she understood, sold her to one Phineas Lovett, that she was then married to one Richard Hopefield and had one child and was then pregnant with another, being the Richard Hopefield at present claimed by Stair Agnew Esquire as his slave. I know it's a lot of names, but just hang in there with me for a minute. Both Joseph Clark and Phineas Lovett were deeply imp implicated in slave owning in the Maritimes and or slave trading to the West Indies. And this is something that a potential postdoc that might be working with me, Chris Baldwin, will be looking at. And my graduate, former graduate student, Sarah Shute, has been examining at the University of Toronto, this connection between slavery in the West Indies and slavery in the Maritimes. Um, after purchasing Stacia, Despite her having a child and being pregnant with another one on the way, Lovett intended for her, and this is taken directly from Stacia's deposition, uh, intended for her to be taken to the West Indies and sold. Amazingly, her husband or long-term partner, Richard Hopefield Sr., who seems to have been an indentured servant, maybe a servant, um, petitioned Governor Carleton requesting that Stacia be, quote unquote, re-delivered to her said husband. And this is what actually happened. And she was told that she was free, this is Stacia, and she could go wherever she pleased within the king's dominions. I mean, this is pretty incredible, right? What a story. But it goes further. After Governor Carleton's surprising action, Stacia noted that she lived for seven years and upwards with her said husband, quietly and undisturbed and in the enjoyment of her liberty. In the early 1790s, Connecticut loyalist insurgent Joseph Clark, and I want everybody 
I have about five minutes left to, to, to hear this really, really, and feel these words that I'm about to speak to you, right? Because I think for her to say this, you, you can only imagine how real it is. He says, or she said, Joseph Clark seized upon her with violence. And we know the wording of this deposition is important because it underlines the brutality and re-enslavement could, that could befall black women in the Maritimes. Now, you know, we all know, or, you know, slavery in the Maritimes is not slavery in Barbados, right? We get it. But my point is, is that especially enslaved black women could be exposed to the greatest levels of brutality. No different actually than women in a place like Jamaica or Barbados or in the Chesapeake or South Carolina. Um, it should all give us pause to look at the word violence because for Stacia to use that word um, and, for, and for the recorder, of what she was saying, William O'Dell, to interpret it that way, given her already difficult life, takes us to the reality of enslaved black people in the Maritimes. Stacia's re-enslavement is something um, that is incredible, right? Um, and it shows how black people, free, indentured, whatever, uh, were always um, at risk for re-enslavement. But I have to say to you, just as a, histor a Canadian historian, what I find surprising is that Clark, who owned at least one other slave who also attempted to escape as a runaway in 1787, which makes it clear that he was a cruel owner. What shocks me about Joseph Clark is that this dude possessed the audacity, I mean, literally, the audacity to um, enslave someone in direct contradiction of what the governor had ordered. And in a society as hierarchical as early New Brunswick, this act strikes me as particularly brazen. Unless he had been given permission to do it from the government, I haven't seen that document quite yet. Um, so after suffering re-enslavement, Stacia runs away again, okay? And in this runaway ad, Joseph Clark describes um, her as a Negro woman slave who was married to Richard uh, Hopefield, uh, uh, Richard Hopefield, that they had two children, a boy about five years old and a girl about 15 years old, uh, 15 months. And Stacia was pregnant again when they tried to escape. That tells you something. An entire family like that trying to escape? I mean, I don't want to sound cruel, but like good luck, right? We, all, we already know from the American literature and also from some of the stuff I've done on runaway slaves. And of course, also, I think other people, Afua and Charmaine have done it as well. Um, you know, the majority of runaway slaves in the Maritimes are younger uh, men for the most part. Not always, but to try to escape as a family, we do have a few families that do try to escape, but it's, I mean, it, it's, it would have been very hard. Joseph Clark also noted that Stacia was of the mulatto class and speaks very fluently. I think we can say at the age of 30 with a large family, Stacia faced exceedingly long odds of being able to escape successfully. And as we get to the end of this, because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of condensing, I hope that's okay with everybody. Basically, what, what ends up happening is that she lives with Clark for a few more years. She's purchased by another, pers uh, another man named Joseph Hewlett, and she's a slave for another 12 years when she files a deposition with the help of lawyer Samuel Denny Street to obtain her son, Richard Hopefield Jr.'s uh, freedom. At the end of the day, they don't get it. The New Brunswick Supreme Court basically upholds slavery in 1805 and 1806. And I'll just close it off by saying what we're trying to do, uh, Jesse and I, um, is we're trying to find out more about this woman's life. And 
we hope we're able to do that. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be back in Halifax and participating in this important conference. Uh, today I'm going to speak on the heyday, what I consider the heyday, black businesses in 19th century Canada. We've been hearing and learning about um, the history of slavery and its impact on Canada as a whole and the enslaved people themselves in Nova Scotia and in Upper Canada, or otherwise known as Ontario. Um, but what happened to these people after they received their freedom? So I'm going to take a look at that and historically, black folks have not been viewed as astute business people. Uh, the Chinese were known as laundry men or bringing Chinese cuisine to our tables through their uh, Chinese restaurants. Jewish immigrants um, were highly identified with the garment industry and other manufacturing businesses and shops, etc. Italians uh, dominated the construction industry, but what were black people viewed as? So here we have uh, images of um, Reverend John Holland, who was a porter. Uh, as well as a, a pastor, and a rare painting of a shoeshine boy in Toronto in 1898. So even before we get to the 19th century, some of the earliest evidence of the business acumen of black people we see through the story of Marie Marguerite Rose, an enslaved woman in 1700s Lewisburg, Nova Scotia, formerly known as Ile Royale on Cape Breton Island. And former slave status did not prevent this woman from becoming a businesswoman who owned a tavern with her Mi'kmaq husband once she became free in 1755. And um, this is a woman who was kidnapped from her home in Guinea, West Africa. In her late teens, she worked as a domestic servant in the home of French military officer for 20 years, uh, obtained her freedom, and then went on to run an inn with her husband. And it's really interesting because they have discovered documents and the property inventoried at the time of her death uh, indicate that she was a respected businesswoman in her own right and on a par with her husband, uh, Jean-Baptiste Laurent. And her story is so remarkable that she was designated a person of national his historic significance in uh, 2009. As many of you may know, uh, the first person to uh, establish a cab company in Toronto was a freedom seeker named Thornton Blackburn. Uh, and this painting uh, depicts, we believe, the cab itself, um, sort of in the middle to the left of the image. Uh, so Thornton Blackburn obtained the design of a Montreal cab and had a replica made that was painted red and yellow, seated four passengers who entered from the rear and was drawn by a single horse. Blackburn had the monopoly of the taxi business for several years beginning in 1837 and went on to become a prosperous member of Toronto's black community with his wife Lucy Blackburn. And you can read about their story in Carolyn Smart's Fraud's book, I've Got a Home in Gloryland. Uh, so many of the early businesses in the 1860s, Victoria and Salt Spring Island, British Columbia, were opened by, the Afri by African Americans who settled, uh, or sorry, who sailed from California in 1859 at the invitation of Sir James Douglas, the first governor of British Columbia. 
and they established tailoring and clothing shops, a hardware store, salmon cannery, a barber shop and boarding house, and formed the backbone of a prosperous business community in that province. And in the mid-1800s, there were dozens of black owned businesses in the downtown area of Toronto. Barber and hairdressing shops, restaurants and taverns, grocery stores and dry goods businesses, carpentry and whitewashing businesses, a ladies shop, and so on. One freedom seeker named John Henry Hill came to Canada after escaping a slave trader while being escorted to the auction block, block in Richmond, Virginia. He hid out for nine months in the free black community in Richmond, then forged a pass to Norfolk and uh, stowed away on a steamer bound for Philadelphia. And he met with William Still in Philadelphia um, uh, who recorded his story and sent him on to Toronto. Uh, he wrote many poignant letters from Canada, from Toronto, which still kept and published later in his book, The Underground Railroad. In one of his letters, we learn that he was able to bring his wife and two sons to Canada uh, in December. of 1853. And two years later, the family moved to Hamilton, Ontario. Hill started out as a carpenter and then established a tobacco factory just outside the eastern city limits. And Samuel Gridley Howe, who was doing interviews of blacks in Canada for the Freedmen's Inquiry Commission, visited Hill's establishment and was apparently astonished at what he saw. So uh, I'm going to quote how. We found Mr. Hill and his three colored partners in business working very earnestly and vigorously in a tobacco manufactory of their own. They had recently le uh, leased a building at $250 a year, made most of the woodwork uh, of the machinery themselves and started their business. By diligent and faithful work, they soon drew custom and their prospects seemed excellent. They employed about 20 hands, among whom were three white boys. The sight of this establishment would astonish those who think Negroes too stupid for business and too lazy for work. It was planned and uh, carried out by colored people with money of their own earning. It was marked by the order, silence, and earnestness which pervade all good workshops. There was no talking, laughing, or looking about. Every man was busy at his task. Some were, leaving, some were heaving down the press with uh, ponderous iron levers. Some were filling boxes, others nailing them up, some assorting the stock, and others rolling it into plugs. Each seemed to have the kind of work best suited to him. The men using their brawny arms for lifting and pulling, the boys their tiny fingers for picking and sorting. They were paid in proportion to the worth of their work and each worked with a will. So here's an example of uh, you know, an ignorant stereotype coming snap dag up against the reality of black excellence. And quoting John Henry Hill, he said, we employ 12 or 14 hands now and have white and black boys at work. There is such a demand for boys that we have to take anybody we can get. Our business is paying about $26 a day and we hope to make it $50 a day. We mean to succeed. Bill spoke about the opportunity that skilled black men had in getting good work. He said, when we came here in 1855, we found no difficulty in getting into the best shops of the city. And after we had worked there, here a while, I believe we were preferred because we were steady and stuck to our work. 
I never heard of any objection being made to taking a colored boy into a shop to learn a trade. One of the best machinists in, machinists in the city will take colored boys into his shop. There is no difficulty in a good colored mechanic getting work among white men. I think the colored people, after a while, will surmount the prejudice against them. So at the end of the Civil War, unfortunately, we lost John Henry Hill and his family because they moved back to Virginia, uh, where he became a successful businessman and the first black justice of the peace in Petersburg, Virginia. And his eldest daughter, Kate Hill, was one of the first African-American school teachers in, in um, Petersburg. And um, she went on to become the principal of the normal preparatory department of the Virginia Normal and Collegiate Institute, now known as Virginia State University. So this is his daughter, uh, Kate Hill. And she married James Colson, a graduate of Dartmouth College. And they had five children, two uh, of whom went on to become college professors. And Edna Mead Colson, standing on the far left, earned her PhD in education from Columbia University. So another interesting family who migrated to Hamilton was the Aaron Massell family. And they went on to, um, they were a free black family from Baltimore, Maryland, who moved to Hamilton in 1851 be, uh, because there were no schools for black children in uh, Baltimore at that time. Aaron, the father, was a successful brick maker. And city directory, directories indicate that they lived on Ray Street in the city before buying five acres of clay land just outside the western city limits. And this is where Aaron established a brickyard. And one of the reasons for Aaron Massell's success was that he was able to estimate the number of bricks he needed for any size contract with amazing accuracy. He also um, was said to donate the brick used to build one of the black businesses in Hamilton. And uh, Nathan, who's seated on the far right in the image, in the picture, um, he was born in Hamilton in 1856 and uh, went on to become a prominent physician and surgeon who founded the Frederick Douglass Memorial Hospital in Philadelphia. And he was also one of the uh, members of the Niagara Movement and founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Philadelphia chapter. And um, when he was um, in his 90s, this was in the 1940s, he wrote a short memoir of his life where he talked about his early beginnings in Hamilton. Uh, his father, Aaron Massell's success was all the more incredible because, um, as Nathan informed us, his father attended night school in Hamilton in order to learn to read and write. Uh, so I'm going to skip on. And um, I want to move back to Toronto for a bit and talk about a man who has virtually been forgotten in the city of his birth. And his name is John Dunkerson Lewis. And John Lewis was born in 1842 in Toronto of parents Henry and Francis Lewis, who left their home in uh, Falmouth, Falmouth, Virginia in the 1830s and settled on Kingston Road, just east of Toronto at that time. Many free black families left Virginia because of the restrictive laws being enacted there to control free blacks after the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831. And according to the eldest son, Henry Lewis Jr., the family first occupied a log cabin on the lot where the old Eaton's store was located at Queen, Young and Queen Streets. And uh, the Lewises were also founding members of the First Baptist Church at Queen and Victoria, the pioneer church of black Baptists in Toronto. So Henry Lewis, the father, prospered. He worked as a carpenter and also operated a nice business in Toronto. 
and in the winter he would harvest blocks of ice from Ashbridge's Bay and starting in April would deliver ice to his customers, um, such as the prominent Denison and Ryerson families of Toronto. And before the days of refrigeration, ice dealers obviously enjoyed a huge business. And two of his sons, Henry Jr. and William James, also became ice dealers in their own right. The third son, Daniel, became uh, a, a skilled carpenter like his father and turned his business uh, acumen to the building trades. But around 1860, John Lewis started a business on Adelaide Street, uh, where St. James Park is now. And it was named the Dominion Tobacco Works. It was quite the business endeavor and um, necessitated an investment of $10,000 in machine machinery. It employed about 100 employees and could employ up to 200 men. And this is how they described uh, the business. This was in the 1867 Toronto Directory. Dominion Tobacco Works at 64 Nelson and 29 Francis Streets, established in 1860 by Mr. J.D. Lewis and Company, who employ a steam engine of 15 horsepower. They have a hydraulic press, etc. Their machinery has been manufactured by Mr. William Hamilton and Son of the St. Lawrence Foundry and uh, Mr. Martin and Son. 75 hands are here constantly employed. This firm manufactures every description of fine cut chewing and smoking tobaccos and all grades of domestic cigars. The business having increased during the past year, a large addition of 90 feet in length has been made in the main building. The whole premises being now 140 feet long by 25 feet wide, three and a half stories high. So uh, the early 1860s was a great time for the Canadian tobacco industry as the Civil War in the United States um, hindered the, the production and manufacture of tobacco products there. So Lewis's tobacco products were processed and sold throughout Canada. John D. Lewis seems to have prospered during the 1860s, but unlike his brothers, he had bigger dreams. And unfortunately, again, for the Canadian part of his story, it ended in the next decade. He married a Miss Louisa Brown of Boston and moved there in 1873, eventually selling his tobacco company. However, with the sale of the, of the tobacco concern, Lewis bought a number of lots on the corner of Adelaide and Jarvis Streets in Toronto, and with his brother William, built many commercial units on Adelaide Street. And this is an image of the building, uh, buildings as they look now. Uh, the rents generated by these well-located businesses gave him an income of $3,500 per year. Uh, but he did not use this revenue to live a life of idleness. He went on to attend Boston University's law school, graduating in 1875. And after the unexpected death of his wife, he moved to Philadelphia and became the first black admitted to the bar in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. He fought for civil rights for African Americans, in particular, the integration of the schools and the post office in Philadelphia. And um, back in Toronto, the John D. Lewis Building is a designated heritage building in Toronto, but the inspiring story of the man who built it has been lost to history. So as more and more freedom seekers and free blacks arrived in the years prior to the U.S. Civil War, Black barbers in their establishments sprang up in towns and cities across Ontario. So I'm going to talk a bit about the phenomenon of the black barber 
in the 19th and early 20th centuries in Canada. As early as 1831, Moses Holmes advertised his skills in the Upper Canadian, to the Upper Canadian public as a fashionable hair cutter and easy shaver in the colonial advocate. Holmes provided testimonials to his exceptional talents as a barber and businessman uh, from white Virginia gentlemen of high standing, where he had operated in Suffolk prior to immigrating to Toronto. When H.F. Gardner, a Hamilton reporter, came to that city in 1870, he observed that most of the barbers in town were black. According to the New York Tribune in 1858, the barbers and waiters in Toronto were, were almost exclusively black. At least 70% of the barbers listed in the 1861 uh, city directory, if you look uh, at the directory, uh, most of those names are, we know, were black people, about 70% of the names. So here are some additional ads. Sorry. Uh, anyway, moving along, uh, at least 70% of the barbers listed in the 1861 Toronto City Directory under barbers and hairdressers can be ident identified as of African ancestry. In London, Ontario, in the early 1870s, roughly 12 out of the 15 barbers there were of African origin. Black barbers even set up shop in towns with little or no black populations to speak of. Brothers James T. Holmes and Benjamin A. Holmes opened businesses in the 1860s and early 1870s in Peterborough and Lindsay, Canada West, or Ontario. The dominance of the black barber was not just an Ontario phenomenon. Across the continent in Victoria, BC, as the first black settlers from San Francisco were arriving in 1858, Wellington Moses was soon running the Pioneer Shaving Saloon and, can, can barely see this, bathroom uh, in brackets, private entrance for ladies. He and other blacks, as Crawford Killian noted, virtually monopolized barbering. On the opposite coast, the grandfather of well-known civil rights icon Viola Desmond established a Davis barber shop in Halifax's North End. Two generations later, Viola herself married uh, Jack Desmond, owner of Jack's Barber Shop. He was popularly known as the King of Cottingen Street. And black barbers in Montreal were a common occurrence in that city. For example, George and James Jones were brothers and partners for a decade in a shaving and hair cutting emporium at 133 McGill Street. So increasingly, the number one skilled occupation held by Hamilton blacks, black men in 1861, 1871, 1881 and 19, 1901 was that of barber. Many black barbers owned their own shops and others worked for or apprenticed with those who did. I, ironically, unlike today, it is also likely that they worked in the white trade, meaning that they catered primarily to a white clientele. The black barber came out of the history of slavery when black men worked in personal service as butlers, valets, servants, and barbers. But in freedom, they turned this tradition into a business opportunity, enabling them to amass considerable wealth. One historian has noted that on the eve of the Civil War, one out of eight African Americans in the Upper South worth at least $2,000 which was the standard for affluence at that time, owned a barber shop. And for a dozen generations, black barbers in the United States dominated the profession. Most worked in the white trade, exclusively cutting the hair of white clientele and combining the elements of the luxury hotel, spa, and clubhouse in their barber shops. 
Their shops were usually located in upscale downtown commercial districts and adorned with first class furnishings. They offered customers hot baths and a range of items for purchase such as perfume, soap, cigars, and suspenders. And I remember I was working with a colleague um, and she was talking to somebody and saying that there were a lot of black barbers in the 19th century. And this person said, well, all they would need is some combs, some razors, some towels, you know, some scissors, and they could just put those in a bag and go in anywhere and do the job. And she said, well, actually, I've seen a couple of images of these black barbers in barber shops, and they have, um, you know, uh, sinks and swivel chairs and uh, nice furnishings and big mirrors and um, really nice uh, light fixtures and so on. Um, but I have no time left. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to quickly go through. These are some rare images of black barbers in their barber shops in uh, Ontario. And these are some ads of black barbers. And um, this is um, Jesse Gant from Hamilton and Alicia Edmonds, who was a barber in Toronto. And I'll end it there. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. Um, I am so excited to be talking about this. So when I did this research and when I did this digging and this journey, um, I was on my own journey to become a high school teacher. So since starting this, I have attained that goal. So I am now in high school teaching. So it's really interesting though that um, I didn't have to finish my research. I've still been actively researching, uh, but my research and what I've been learning and, and kind of my duality of being a student and at the same time being a teacher has uh, made it all the more relevant and interesting to me. So super quick about me. Um, this is my children. Um, I live in Bear River, Nova Scotia. Um, I feel <laughs> around all of you, um, like the little guy, <laughs> um, all of you are so well decorated and, and so successful, uh, but I really am passionate about this and um, really excited to be here. Um, so my, my goal in doing this is to provide a foundation, to do uh, kind of a springboard for more, more research. So in my area that I grew up, I grew up in Digby, I now live in Bear River, but in my area, um, being Digby and Annapolis County, we say we are the hub of the history. Um, we kind of pride ourselves on the history that we have and, and we advertise it and um, parades, we say how um, we have the guy at the front of the parade with the bell saying he's the loyalist, he's the Admiral Digby. And we have all that, but we're ignoring a large part of the historical record. And if we're gonna pick and choose what part of the historical record we're gonna acknowledge, it, it leaves the history to be fiction. Um, so that is my whole goal. Also, this African proverb um, that until the lions have their historians, the tales of the, of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. So um, I made a note of it. I think it was actually Dr. Whitfield that had said that what we have written about enslaved people was written by the enslavers, and, and we can't change that. But what we can change is the history that we have available to us right now, or the documentation that we have available to us right now. I'm not gonna bore you with all that. Uh, you know all about it. <laughs> um, how this all relates, though, to education and to teaching high school, um, when I start talking about slavery and when I start talking about history, a lot of times their eyes glaze over. <laughs> Nine times out of 10, that's what happens. They're 
all but drooling on themselves until they see how it relates to them and how it relates to today. It's not just us telling stories. It's not just us talking about what happened. It, it affects today. And in order to understand today and understand our place, anyone's place in the world, you need to understand the past. Um, so it goes back to the Acadian expulsion. They have all, in my area, they have all heard about the Acadian expulsion. They could stand up here and they could recite it to you word for word from the time they're about in third grade. But what they don't understand or what they haven't been told is part of the proclamation that was sent to the United States to try to get um, planters up here uh, was anybody who comes up here will be given 100 acres of land. On top of that 100 acres of land, you'll be given an additional 50 acres of land for every man, woman, and child that you bring with you, enslaved or free. So the general narrative that we have in Canada is we're the good guys, we have the Underground Railroad, we're the nice people. Um, and I'm not saying that any of that's untrue, but yet again, we need to make sure that the record is complete and that it's accurate. And if we're going to make it complete and make it accurate, then we need to acknowledge that this was said. So this document says that not only are we um, encouraging people to bring enslaved people here to Nova Scotia, but we're actually giving them an incentive to do so. Um, so a lot of families, because um, land is is rich, land is what brings you uh, prosperity, especially in these times. So a lot of families, long time uh, prosperity ha started with this proclamation. Um, when they came here um, by 1750, a quarter of the families in Connecticut owned slaves. So I'm not a mathematical person, I actually am really horrible at math, but if we're just gonna use logic, if a quarter of the people from Connecticut had enslaved people, when those people from Connecticut came here, it makes sense or it stands to logic that 25% of those families came with enslaved people. Um, so we need to acknowledge that these people came and that not only did they come, they weren't just m mindless followers, they were people who established our economy, they established our infrastructure, they helped build our culture into what it is today, they helped build us into what we are today. Um, this is just kind of an interesting piece of documentation. So this is in 1767. So this is after the Acadian expulsion. This is after a whole bunch of uh, those families brought enslaved people here. This is a census that says in 1767 in all of Annapolis County, so this was before Digby County existed. So all of Annapolis County, there were only six uh, black people living in Annapolis County, which doesn't make sense at all. So what? I'm asserting or what I believe from the documentation is that these censuses or these documents that we have historically are either cherry picking who they want to consider in the censuses which could be that these people were free the six people were free or it could be that they're just choosing who they want to include and who they don't want to include the reason why I'm bringing this up and discussing it is because it highlights that we can't 100% trust even primary sources. So it's the, and I think Dr. Uh, Cooper says it in a lot of what she writes and a lot of what she says, the intentional erasure of black history or a black presence is evidence in and of itself and it's something that we need to acknowledge. We can't just kind of wipe it underneath the rug and ignore it. Um, also, so I said free, like I think they were Maybe that's what the thing was, was that they were free. But it doesn't make sense because in a, um, another primary source, there were four families who were mentioned, the Winnet families, two Winnet families who were two of them. They brought 11 slaves um, just a few years before that. So six does not make any sense at all. And again, the only reason I'm bringing that up is just to highlight or call attention to the fact that the primary sources are tampered with sometimes or, in, or intentionally um, modified or altered. Uh, so again, in my area, we're all about the loyalists and we're all about acknowledging the loyalists and we're all about 
acknowledging that that's where Digby kind of got its start was, uh, well, <laughs> Mi'kmaq people, but <laughs> Digby got its colonized start from the Loyalist. Um, so again, we talk a lot about that. We have the Admiral Digby Museum. We have boats named after Digby. We have restaurants named after the Admiral Digby. We have all this great stuff about white Loyalists. And we talk sometimes about the black loyalists, but we never talk about the enslaved people who came. And again, it wasn't that they just came, it was that they came um, and they were forced to uh, build our roads, build our buildings, build our houses, build the churches, um, think of ways to help the farmers, things like that. Um, so I took a guy out of my presentation on purpose and as a historian, I understand we're not supposed to make judgments on people of the past, but he really irritates me, so I took him out. Um, <laughs> he was one of the influential people in Annapolis, and I think Dr. Cutro, you would, uh, James Delancey. Um, he was one of the most prominent people in Annapolis, and he um, enslaved. That's not why he annoys me. A lot of the influential people, it was the time we have to think about why they thought it was okay to enslave. What annoys me about him is that he had two voices. So he would say things um, really derogatory about the enslaved people and to minimize their input and their influence in his life. But at the same time, the same person, when he had an enslaved person run away from him, he went to the court and he said, because this person hasn't been with me, because he ran away, and what the core issue was, was that the person who ran away ran to a Halifax merchant. So the merchant was considered to be um, housing him or catering to him. And that was why Delancey launched the, the lawsuit, was he wanted his enslaved person back. So Delancey, the same person who says, you know, these people just help me, but they're not really influential, he also said, I need to have that person back because not having that person has cost me this much money. It has meant that I can't do my duties at the town hall because I need to stay home and I need to do farming. Um, I can't help my wife do certain things that she needs my help with because I'm busy doing the things that James usually, or the, the enslaved person usually does. So the same person is saying two things and that's why he kind of irritates me is because of his duality and yeah so I, I took him out but here I am talking about him still um, so in the book of Negroes um, there is and actually it's a really cool database I don't know if I'm sure a lot of you have I don't know if anyone wasn't aware that uh, the historical document of the book of Negroes actually has a database so you can search names or you can search a ship name or a date or things like that and it'll come up um, with the details of who came and if they were free or enslaved or what the details are. So going off of that database and looking at who came to Annapolis County. Keep in mind, Annapolis County at the time was a big hub. So just because they came to Annapolis County doesn't mean they stayed in Annapolis County. It could have just been a stayover. Also, the same person who I don't like to talk about, but I'm talking about him lots, he came with enslaved people, but he, his enslaved people are not in the Book of Negroes because just before the end of the war, he went to England with the enslaved people and stayed there for 11 months, then came from England to Annapolis. So this is a cool document and it's really interesting and it's really informative, but again, it's not the be all end all. But according to this database, um, these are the names on the bottom. You probably can't see them, but Captain Hicks, Colonel Cole, Gabriel Purdy, John Lewis, John Ryerson, Major McLean, Mrs. Grant, and Thomas Grigg. These are the people who um, came with the most enslaved people, um, and, and it kind of gives a breakdown there. So Captain Higgs, he came with five enslaved people total. Um, he came with one woman, one man, and three children. Uh, Colonel Cole came with four people, Gabriel Purdy four, John Lewis and John Ryerson and Major McLean came with three people, 
Mrs. Grant came with four, and Thomas Griggs came with three. Why that's important is because this is 1783. So slavery in Digby and Annapolis County was still alive in, by 1808. So 1783 to 1808 meant that these people grew to have families of their own. Slavery kind of perpetuated. Um, these are the names, which is really interesting to me because I forget who said it already today. It's all about giving these people um, a piece of humanity and, and acknowledging that they were people. It's not just a historical name on a piece of paper. They're actually people who influence us every day. So these are the people who came to Annapolis County um, as enslaved people, and it kind of gives you their name. Um, how old they were, their owner, their place of origin, their ship, the shipmaster, and the date. When I show students this list, um, it always kind of gets them to rub their eyes. They get rid of that glassy look that they have because they can see a lot of times um, the surname that their uncle has or that they have or that their neighbor has. So it shows them that this, again, is not dead. It's, it's weaved its way into our lives today in 2022. The list goes on. It's quite a long one. Um, and if anybody's interested in that, I'd be more than, well, more than happy to share it with you. Um, also, place names. So Clements Vale, Clements Port, uh, that's in Annapolis County. That was named after an enslaved person. It's kind of an interesting story. Um, I'll move on for the sake of time. But Clements Vale and Clements Township was named after Francis Clements, who was an enslaved person. So as somebody who's all about... Um, where we can see material culture or where we can see kind of see like archaeology kind of play and stuff this is no more evidence than what anybody would need to show that slavery was alive and well in our area and that it's still affecting our daily life um so the reason i put this up is that it slavery or slaveholders didn't discriminate so the popular misconception was oh my family was too poor we didn't enslave people um, that kind of practice was outdated by the time people came to Annapolis and Digby County. Anybody and everybody um, could and, and did enslave people. I'm going to, yeah, there he is there. I guess I didn't get rid of him. That is actually the court document, though. That's the real, that's the original court document where he was suing. It was William Wooden who, who he was suing. Uh, I'm going to fast forward here. Um, so this one always gets me. I have a two-year-old at home, um, and I know through slavery when we do our research, we always know that the, the slaveholder would always threaten, if you don't do what I tell you to do, then I will separate your family. Or on the flip side, if you do what I tell you to do, I'll make sure your family stays together. Um, we, I, we always know. As, as historians and researchers that that's what happened. But what gets my students and what, what they need to see is that this is a primary source document that in um, 1796, a two-year-old child was sold from one family to another. So all we have is this, is this bill of sale. We don't know what the background of it was, where this child's family was, if this child was deliberately being sold as a form of retaliation or punishment or what was going on. But what we do know beyond a shadow of a doubt is this two-year-old got, got sold and, and replaced from one family to another. Um, I'm going to fast forward again. This is a super interesting story. So this is in Annapolis County. It's in Clements Vale. Um, so Dow Dittmar, who was a super influential person in Clements Vale, he um, was enslaving a mom and her two children, um, Eliza Anthony uh, and Elizabeth Van Elmel now. So this is in 1800. So this primary source is actually the petition because the government came and they took the three enslaved people. And it took me a really long time to try to figure out why or how or, or what happened. But um, getting ready for this symposium actually was what kind of cracked the case for me after all these years of trying. What it was was that um, Blowers, who was at the time the Chief Justice in Nova Scotia, he was anti-slavery, and he was trying to get slavery abolished, and he had his ways of trying to do it. And he wrote in a letter, coincidentally in January of 1800, so keep in mind, 
these people were taken in 1800. I don't know the month or the day, but they were taken in 1800. And this petition is saying, um, it's all the people in Clemensville, that, and it starts by saying, it's really aggressive, it's kind of, and that's what gets my students, is it's really sassy. They're like, whereas dotes have arisen to the legality of slavery, and then they go on to basically say, slavery is alive and well, and if you're gonna start taking people's property and people's enslaved people, come at us, is what they're basically saying. Um, so this is what Blowers wrote to Chipman. He said, uh, and again, I have no way of knowing for sure if it's the same case, but it has a lot of similarities. He says, a black woman was brought behind before me on habeas corpus for the goal of Annapolis, uh, from the gal of Annapolis. So that's, that sounds really similar. Um, the return was defective and she was discharged, but as she was claimed as a slave, I intimidated that an action should be brought to try the right and one that brought against the person who had received and hired the wench. At the trial, the plaintiff proved a purchase of the Negro in New York as a slave. It's interesting because Dow Dittmar was from New York. Um, but he could not prove that the seller had a legal right to dispose of her. I dejected the jury to find that it the defendant, which they did. So he did end up getting to keep the person and her children, um, but kind of the, the more details of that isn't well known of why or anything like that. And again, I don't know for sure if it's related. It just has a lot of similarities. This is the house that they lived in and the house that she would have helped take care of and the groundskeeping and stuff. Um, I'm just gonna fast forward here really, really quickly. Um, so going through the baptism and burial records, these are just some of the examples I have. Um, so unwaveringly, when you look at these records, they say like a black child died, or the black man of John Polemus died, or things like that. So they aren't given a lot of attention or record, but they were actual people. And those people, again, are the people who, uh, the roads that we drive every day in Digby and Annapolis, the churches that people attend in Digby and Annapolis were built, this church in the background uh, was built with the help of enslaved people, our economy. So um, Afua Cooper, I think it was, was talking about the, um, the West Indies and that relation. Right next to my house, there's a graveyard and I'm really weird, so I like to look at graves for fun. And when I found these two brothers who had died and I researched why and how they died, they died in a shipwreck going down to the West Indies to trade with salt fish. Uh, so it's all in interconnected, it's all related. Um, that's why I think it's important that we talk about this in high school. It's also important that we make the public record not popular, not just for high schoolers, but for the general population. I feel like I just spit a whole bunch of information at you. But thank you again so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. One of the absolute worst things about moderating these things is getting people to stop talking when you really want to hear more about what they have to say. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Amani uh, for his paper on Stacia, um, Adrian on her tour de force on black businesses across Canada, and uh, Candina for her work on Digby in Annapolis County. Um, I think I should tell everyone, Carolyn Smarts Frost talks about Candina as having the fire in her belly, and she does. So I'd like to thank them all, and um, I think we're going to a break now. If you have questions for 